I've got the uh, Restream logo up there in the corner. Uh, so I'm giving it a try, hoping it shows up on my Facebook page. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, we'll give it a few seconds here. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, I am back in my office from Idaho. Uh, we had a nice trip over there, uh, but we're back and uh, ready to continue on with the Gospel of John. But first we have a song. And so let's see if I can get the song working here. Uh, a little better quality uh, slides here. So let's see, how am I going to get this to work? Jesus, thou mighty Lord, Lord, great is thy name, still through eternal years thou art the same, changeless thy holy word, true evermore, thy name we glorify, thy name adore. Jesus, thou mighty Lord, Jesus, our King, praise for thy wondrous love, gladly we sing, love in thy diadem shines evermore. Thy name we glorify, thy name adore. Sought by thy mercy, Lord, saved by thy power, led by thy gracious hand, kept every hour. Thine shall the honor be, thine evermore. Thy name we glorify, thy name adore. All right, I hope that came through. Give me a while to get used to this thing. All right. Well, we're in uh, John 12, 1 to 26. Looks like I'm on here. <laughs> so uh, always good to try new things. Uh, so I'm back in full screen mode. And uh, I've also been watching the... Uh, the Lord of the Rings, the new Lord of the Rings prequel uh, on Amazon Prime, uh, and I haven't decided if it's any good or yet, uh, any good yet. Uh, but it's interesting uh, to see the characters from the book and the uh, other movies uh, when they were much, much younger. Uh, one of the characters in the prequel is Galadriel, the elf, and in the first Lord of the Rings movie, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, uh, Frodo offers to give her the one ring. Uh, and she envisions what it would be like if she had the ring of power. Uh, and she says that she would be terrible and great, uh, stronger than the foundations of the earth. All would love me and despair, she says. Uh, but the ring destroys everybody who possesses it. Uh, and so Galadriel resists the temptation to take the ring. Uh, and she says, I have passed the test. I will diminish and remain Galadriel. Uh, and so today's passage is from John 12, uh, 12 to 26. And uh, we learn in this passage that success is found in dying to self and seeking the honor that comes from God. And so that's John 12, 12 to 26. Uh, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. 
So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. They began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Might take me a while to learn how to run this thing. There. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Do not be afraid, people of Zion. Look, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things when they first happened, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that these things had happened to him. So the crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were continuing to testify about it because they had heard that Jesus had performed these miraculous signs. The crowd went out to meet him. Thus the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you can do nothing. Look, the world has run off after him. Now some Greeks were among those who had gone up to worship at the feast. So these approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and they both went and told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the solemn truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The one who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be too. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so in... Um, 12, 12 to 19, we see the Messiah's purpose in the first advent uh, as compared to what the crowd uh, thinks Messiah's purpose would be or what they hope he would do. Uh, we also see that people bear witness to what Jesus had been doing, but there is continuing opposition to Jesus's mission. Uh, and so Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, uh, which is significant. Uh, previously, he had left Jerusalem because the uh, religious leaders were, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the religious leaders were hostile to him. Uh, but he had come back to Bethany to uh, have this supper with uh, Lazarus and Lazarus's sisters, Martha and Mary. Uh, and so he was heading from Bethany into Jerusalem. Uh, so if he is headed to Jerusalem, he is headed into danger. Well, in verses 12 to 13, we have the crowd's desire for Jesus. Uh, this is what they want Jesus to do. And it says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. They began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And so this is the first Palm Sunday, uh, which we still observe and celebrate in our churches. At a few churches we've attended, uh, we've had Fern Sunday. Uh, and the kids will each get a big fern uh, or some other kind of branch, and they'll march around the sanctuary with their ferns. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, but it may not be obvious to us what the crowd is looking for here. What are they seeking? Uh, the palm branches are a symbol of Israel, but they weren't always a symbol of Israel. Uh, they were sometimes used during the Feast of the Tabernacles, but not at the Feast of the Passover, uh, which is what we have here. And so what's going on? Uh, well, the use of the palm branches as a symbol of Israel dates back from the days of the Maccabees. And around 164 BC, the, the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes had uh, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> and the Jews under Judas Maccabees, well, they revolted. 
and they had retaken the temple and had cleansed it and then they rededicated it. Uh, and palm branches were used in the procession uh, that was doing the, the rededication of the, te the temple. Uh, and this event is dedicated or is celebrated uh, at the Feast of Dedication, which we saw back in chapter 10. And we know it today as Hanukkah, which is celebrated around Christmas. Uh, we can read about all these things in the books that were written between the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, we call these books the Apocrypha, and we didn't include them in our Bibles, uh, but they're still interesting and worthy books for the history. That They're just not scripture for us. <clears throat> well, this incident is recorded in the book of the Maccabees. Eventually, uh, full political independence was secured by the Jews under uh, Simon Maccabees. Uh, this happened in 141 BC, and palm branches were used again in the celebrations of this event. And so they were even used then on coins that the Jews would make uh, when they would revolt from time to time under the Roman domination or whoever was uh, had occupied uh, Israel. Uh, so the palm branches had become uh, so established as a symbol of Israel that sometimes the Romans would use uh, the palm branches as symbols on the coins they would make when uh, they had come in and crushed the various rebellions that the Jews had done. Uh, it was a, a very good way to tweak the Jews a little bit by putting their national symbol on a Roman coin. Uh, so it's clear from the symbolism of the palm branches uh, that the crowd is wanting Jesus to be a political and military figure who will lead a revolt that will result in political and national independence from the Roman occupation, uh, just like the Maccabees. And this desire would not have been lost on the Jewish religious leaders, uh, or maybe not even on the Romans uh, who were there in Jerusalem. Uh, and this is confirmed by what the Jews say next uh, in, uh, in verse uh, 13 still. Uh, they say, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Uh, and the first part of that is from Psalm 118. And that's a psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, thanksgiving to God for granting victory to his people. And Hosanna is a Hebrew word, so you have, you know some Hebrew. Uh, it means save now, and it's an imperative or a command. Uh, although when we use a, an imperative when we're talking to God, uh, we usually make it in the form of a polite request and not a command. Uh, the na on the end, Hosanna, uh, is a particle uh, it's a Hebrew particle for either now, save now, but it's sometimes used with an imperative uh, as a way of saying please to soften the command uh, aspect of the imperative. Uh, we don't go around commanding God to do things. Uh, we ask nicely, save please or save now. Well, not only do they say uh, shout save now uh, to Jesus, they say Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And blessed is another way of saying welcome. Uh, and the term, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, by this time had become a designation of Messiah. So they are saying, welcome Messiah. And then they add their own words, blessed is the king of Israel. Uh, or we might say, welcome king of Israel. Uh, so the crowd sees Jesus as Messiah, uh, which is the same thing as the king of Israel. Uh, at least they hope he is. Uh, and they see the Messiah as a political, military, nationalistic leader who will free them from the Roman occupation and then set up a renewed and restored kingdom of Israel. Well, Jesus doesn't quite take them up on their desires. And I kind of wonder if there was any temptation uh, for him uh, in this sort of offer of uh, 
to be king of Israel? Was there temptation for Jesus to grab a hold of the ring? Uh, the John doesn't say one way or the other, really. Uh, other New Testament passages say that Jesus was tempted in every way like we are. And so maybe there was some temptation there. Uh, well, what does Jesus do? Verses 14 and 15 say, uh, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, do not be afraid, people of Zion, look. Your king is coming seated on a donkey, on a donkey's colt. Uh, so there's symbolism here too. Uh, if a king of Israel was headed off to war, he would ride a horse. But when he was coming in peace, he would ride a donkey. And so Jesus is saying that he is coming in peace. Uh, verse 15 is a quotation from Zechariah 9.9 which foretells the first coming of the Messiah. Uh, the next verse in Zechariah says, uh, I will remove the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be removed. Then he will announce peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Uh, and so given what we know about history and Jesus's first coming, this must be referring to the second coming. Uh, and so verse 9 uh, talks about the first coming of Messiah, and verse 10 talks about the second coming. Uh, and in the second coming, Messiah will bring peace to the nations, and he will rule uh, to the ends of the earth. Uh, but the first coming is not going to be for the purpose of overthrowing the Roman government by means of military victory. Uh, so uh, Jesus's entry into Jerusalem on a donkey is also reminiscent of King Solomon. Uh, back in 1 Kings 1, David is old and dying, and his son Adonijah tries to seize the throne and become king. Uh, the prophet Nathan tells Bathsheba, uh, Solomon's mother, to go to David and remind him that he had promised that Solomon would be king after him. And that's what Bathsheba does. And Nathan arrives uh, as Bathsheba and David are talking. Well, David says, we'll go have Zadok the priest put Solomon on my own donkey and then lead him down to Gihon. There, uh, when they get there, they're going to anoint Solomon as king and then follow him up as he rode the, on the donkey uh, and then have Solomon sit on David's throne. Uh, there was no temple at that time because Solomon is the one who built the first temple. Uh, but the throne would have been in Jerusalem. And so maybe Jesus rode along the very same path that Solomon took. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, Solomon's name in Hebrew is Shlomo, uh, which sounds kind of derogatory, you Shlomo, <laughs> but it's not derogatory. Uh, it's derived from the Hebrew word uh, Shalom, which means peace. Uh, and so where David's rule was filled with warfare and bloodshed, Solomon's reign was going to be characterized by peace. Uh, and his name even means peace, or at least comes from the word peace. Uh, so given all of the symbolism and the scripture quotations that John gives us, uh, it is clear that Jesus responded to the crowd's uh, desire for a Maccabean-type uh, liberator with symbolism to demonstrate that he was coming as a different kind of Messiah, one of peace and not of war. Uh, and verse 16 is added in there, and it says, uh, His disciples did not understand these things when they were first happened. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that these things had happened to him. Uh, and so uh, the disciples probably would have caught on to the Maccabean connection uh, and maybe some of them even had this, these desires or hopes for Jesus too. Uh, 
but it appears they did not catch on to the symbolism of Jesus riding on the donkey until after he was crucified and raised from the dead. Uh, and then they made the connection to that symbolism and to the prophecy in Zechariah. So a couple of things to say here. Uh, I was thinking it was kind of ironic that we celebrate Palm Sunday by having kids uh, wave palm branches or ferns in a procession around the sanctuary. Uh, and if in the past, if I knew the meaning of the palm branches uh, relating to the Maccabees, uh, I, don't, I don't think I thought about it very much. Uh, I don't ever remember being taught the underlying meaning of the symbolism of the palm branches. Uh, obviously, nobody, uh, at least not too many people, intended the symbolism of the Palm Sunday uh, in the same way that people did when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem uh, on that first Palm Sunday. Uh, except that we know more now, and we therefore hope uh, that on Jesus' second coming, uh, he will straighten things out and we will finally have shalom peace uh, in the full meaning of the Hebrew word shalom. Uh, it's not just absence of war, but uh, peace and harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. Uh, and that will be at Jesus' second coming. Uh, the other thing I thought about is uh, that my ballot arrived in the mail the other day, and I try to avoid uh, doing politics on here because it, uh, it's so divisive. Uh, but I think we, uh, we tend to get our ballots uh, or whatnot, and then we cry out, Hosanna, uh, save us now to whatever candidate or issue we are supporting uh, as if a human political figure or a piece of legislation will save us. Uh, not that I don't think that some candidates would be better than others, better leaders, uh, and have superior policies, uh, because I do. Uh, and not that I don't think that some ways of doing things are wiser and will result in better lives for more people. I think that too. Uh, but I don't think we should have the mindset, uh, a mindset of shouting out, Hosanna, when we consider these things. Uh, we shouldn't put our faith or our trust in human leaders or in legislation. We should put our faith and hope in God and in his plan. Uh, all right, politics done for today. Uh, the more important thing we can do is described here in verses 17 and 18, where John says, uh, so the crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were continuing to testify about it. Because they had heard that Jesus had performed this miraculous sign, the crowd went out to meet him. Thus the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you can do nothing. Look, the world has run off after him. Uh, and so some of the people who were there in Jerusalem for the Passover had also been in Bethany when Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And so naturally, these people were telling other people <coughs> about it. I was there. I saw it happen. Uh, and seeing somebody raised from the dead uh, is a, an amazing thing. Uh, we don't see that every day. Uh, as a consequence, people who heard that Jesus had done this miraculous thing, they also went out to meet him, to see what he was all about. Well, all of us, if we are believers, have been raised from the dead too. Paul says in Ephesians uh, 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. And that is also an amazing thing. Uh, to be made alive together with Christ. And we could be like those people in Jerusalem who had been in Bethany, and we could spend our time continuing to testify about the miracle that happened to us uh, and maybe other miracles that 
Jesus has performed that we have witnessed. And maybe when people hear about this, hear about how we were spiritually raised from the dead, uh, they too will go out to meet Jesus and to be made alive together with him. <clears throat> well, now, as back then, uh, there will often be ongoing opposition to Jesus's mission. And verse uh, 19 says, uh, as I read, I guess I read too far. Thus the Pharisees said to one another, look, you see that you can do nothing. The world has run off after him. Uh, and so the Pharisees were very frustrated. Excuse me. Uh, because they have been planning to arrest Jesus and even kill him. Uh, but they are failing and the people are going and running off after Jesus. Well, you know, what would you expect? He had, he had raised someone from the dead, and now the crowd is waving palm branches for him as he enters Jerusalem. Uh, it would be very difficult for people uh, living under the Roman occupation, uh, under the oppression, uh, maybe people who had various diseases and other things wrong with them, be very difficult for them not to run after him. Uh, he is bringing hope. Uh, their hopes will soon be dashed because Jesus did not come to do what they were expecting. Well, we too may experience continuing opposition to Jesus's mission. Uh, ours will be different, probably. Uh, we will face opposition from Satan in many forms. Uh, other religions will oppose us and try to draw people away from Christianity to their own religion, away from Jesus. Uh, we will face accusations of being judgmental and self-righteous. Uh, hopefully those accusations are not true. Uh, we might face persecution from the government or from other people. Uh, but none of that should deter us from our mission. Uh, and our mission in the church age is a little different uh, from Jesus's mission. Uh, Jesus came to God's people, to his people, the Jews, uh, but they rejected him. And throughout scripture, uh, even here, there are indications that God's people will someday include not only the Jews, but the Gentiles too. Uh, and that's what we see here. Uh, the Pharisees had just said... The world has run off after him. <laughs> and they probably said more than they thought they were saying. Uh, here in 12, 20 to 22, it says, uh, now some Greeks were among those who had gone up to worship at the feast. So these Greeks approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, sir, we would like to see Jesus. Uh, Philip went and told Andrew, and they both went and told Jesus. <clears throat> so some Greeks, Gentiles, had gone up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Uh, and apparently they were God-fearers. A God-fearer is someone uh, back then who believed in God and worships God, uh, but didn't take the necessary steps to become a Jew. Uh, it was possible for Gentile to take some certain steps and become first a proselyte uh, and then a Jew after they had met the conditions. Uh, and there were many God-fearing uh, people uh, at this time, many God-fearing Gentiles, and that made it much easier for them to become Christians after Jesus was crucified and resurrected uh, because they already believed in God, and because they were God-fearers, they studied the Old Testament, and so they knew a lot of the Hebrew scripture. Well, they might have approached Philip because he had a Greek name, uh, but whatever the reason was, Philip went to Andrew, and they go together to tell Jesus that these Greek people want to meet with him. Uh, well, we might have thought or expected Jesus to say, yeah, bring him on in. Uh, but he says instead, uh, beginning in 23, 
uh, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the solemn truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The one who loves his life destroys it, and the one who hates his life in this world guards it for eternal life. If anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be too. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. <clears throat> uh, so it must have been quite a thing to uh, hang around with Jesus uh, and ask him questions and get these kind of responses. <laughs> and uh, these are uh, a few jam-packed verses, probably worthy of a full sermon in themselves. Uh, first, Jesus says that his time has come. And previously in John, uh, we've seen a few times uh, that it's often been said, uh, his time has not yet come, or Jesus knew his time had not yet come. Uh, but now the time has come. Uh, and so that's a little bit of a switch uh, in the story. Uh, the second thing he talks about is a seed. Uh, and if you are a farmer or a gardener, uh, you know that if you have a seed and it stays in the package uh, and doesn't get planted in the ground, it's not going to grow. Uh, but if it gets planted in the soil, uh, it will grow and it will produce uh, fruit or vegetables or whatever kind of plant it is. Uh, Jesus is talking about wheat here. Uh, when we were over in Idaho, uh, one of Brenda's uncles uh, and aunt, aunt and uncles, uh, they farm wheat and they have uh, thousands of acres of wheat and they had just finished harvest and they then had planted some for uh, next year. Uh, and it was already grown a little bit. Uh, but if they had harvested and just stored it away in the grain bin, uh, they would not have any wheat next year. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in Jesus' parable, it's wheat, like uh, over in Idaho. Uh, we planted pumpkins, uh, had a few, I think, three little hills of pumpkins with three seeds each in each hill. Uh, and we have quite a harvest of pumpkins. I think I we got six pumpkins left if anybody needs a pumpkin. Uh, but what is the parable for us? Uh, if we love our life, we're going to protect it and we're going to try to live for ourselves. Uh, but in the end, our lives will be destroyed. But if we hate our lives uh, in this world, we will live for God and we will guard our life for, he will guard our life for eternal life. Uh, so loving our lives means to give our lives priority over God's mission, over God's plan. But in contrast, to hate one's life is to give God's mission priority over our own self-interest. Uh, and so in the Hebrew, love and hate uh, are a little more nuanced than they are for us. Uh, when, uh, when you love somebody, you, it's a verb, uh, right? And so it's not just feeling uh, love toward them, you do something for them. Uh, and when you hate somebody, it's not so much that you dislike them and despise them, it could be, uh, but when you hate somebody, you don't do anything for them. Uh, and so that's uh, kind of the difference uh, along along with the emotional, the feeling part of it. Uh, and so if we love our life, we're going to focus on doing things for our own life uh, at the expense of what God would want us to do. But if we hate our lives, uh, we don't necessarily despise it and that kind of thing, but we don't do anything for it. Uh, we focus on doing what God wants us to do. Uh, so loving our lives is parallel with the seed. Uh, the seed remaining in its package, while hating our lives is equivalent to the seed dying and being planted in the ground. The only way we are going to produce a harvest for God is if we hate uh, our self-interest and we give God's interest the priority in everything that we do. Uh, and the ironic part is that hating our lives and giving it up for God uh, actually guards our lives for 
eternity, whereas loving our lives and living for our own self-interest uh, may seem like the better route to go, uh, but it actually causes our lives to be destroyed. Uh, sort of like Galadriel and taking the ring. It seemed like a good thing, but in the end, it would have destroyed her and her life. Uh, and Jesus is our prime example, of course. Uh, he could have given in to this temptation and allowed the Jews to make him king. And he might even have had a great military victory over the Romans. Oh. That was different. <laughs> My dad calling. Uh, where were we? Uh, so Jesus might have won a great victory over the Romans. Uh, I'm sure he would have been a tremendous military leader. Uh, he would have had zealous followers. Uh, so he might have been able to do it. Uh, I'm sure he would have been able to do it. Uh, he might even have had some Greeks come in and bring them also into his kingdom and help uh, in this kingdom he's setting up. Uh, but none of that is what uh, God wanted. Uh, it was not God's plan. Uh, if Jesus had followed the temptation, he might have had a brief moment of victory, but in the end, his life would have been destroyed. Uh, no, Jesus knows that his hour has come and he must finish the task that God has assigned him, uh, and so he must go forward and allow himself to be humiliated and crucified like a common criminal. Uh, and he does this because he hates his life in this world. He is not going to give it priority over God's plan. Uh, therefore, if we want to serve Jesus, we must follow him, follow his example, obey his teaching, uh, emulate his character. Uh, and where Jesus is, that's where we must be as well. And the consequence of this kind of life is that God the Father will honor us. Uh, the consequence of living for ourselves is that our lives will be destroyed, uh, maybe in this lifetime, but certainly uh, when we die or when Jesus returns. Well, if uh, Galadriel had taken the ring from Frodo, she would have become a queen, great and terrible, more powerful than the foundations of the earth. Uh, but the ring eventually would have destroyed her. Uh, it is parallel to our story uh, today. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, uh, he was a Christian. And he hung around with C.S. Lewis, uh, another great writer uh, and Christian. And Tolkien said that The Lord of the Rings was a very Christian book. Uh, so it's kind of fun to watch the movies and look for all these Christian symbols uh, to see what he was trying to convey. Uh, now, I don't know if the incident with uh, Galadriel uh, in the first movie was intended by Tolkien to be parallel with uh, John 12 here. Uh, but from both of them, we learn that success is found in dying to self and seeking honor from God. <coughs> Excuse me again. Okay, well, let's have a word of prayer here. Uh, and then we got another song. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your love and mercy and grace. Uh, thank you uh, for us who uh, are believers, Christians, that we have been raised uh, from spiritual death uh, into life with Christ, made alive together with Christ. Uh, thank you for that miracle in our lives. Uh, pray that you will give us opportunities to uh, share this uh, miracle with others, to testify what Jesus has done for us and what he can do for them. Uh, we have a needy world, and uh, the answer is uh, Jesus. Uh, so give us uh, boldness to share uh, your message, Jesus's message with the world. Uh, give us opportunities. 
pray a blessing on all who tune in and hear this. Pray that your word will uh, transform their hearts and minds uh, and they will become more like Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we got another song here. If I can make it work, <laughs> I'll get better. All right. There we go. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayers attend. Come and thy people bless and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear in this glad hour. Thou who almighty art now rule in every heart and ne'er from us depart spirit of power. To the great one in three, eternal praises be, and evermore. Thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. All right. I hope that worked. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for tuning in and uh, plan to be back next week, God willing. So have a great week and hope to uh, hope you'll tune in then. Bye-bye.